Welcome everybody for another installment of Gardens and Grub, all things food. I am Sherilyn Berry, your uh, friend and extension agent in Durham County. And we're going to talk today about um, a delicious salad vegetable that's in season right now. Uh, but if you'd like to ask a question at about the 20 minute mark, um, please raise your hand or write a question in the chat. And we would be glad to answer all of your food questions about this particular topic or any gardening or food topic that comes to mind. So uh, we, today we are going to talk about a summer crop that is uh, the fifth most, po most uh, popular garden vegetable or in the top five, and that is a cucumber. So we're gonna do a little series on this family and they are called the cucurbits. So, and the word cuke is in the family cucurbits. I think it's the cutest name uh, for a family of vegetables. So technically this is a fruit because it is a fruit of a vine. It has seeds inside of it and it has this sort of large body that comes from pollination of a flower. Um, so this is a fruit, but the USDA for, um, for administrative purposes, they call this a vegetable. Um, and in America, often we will call uh, things that are savory and unsweet uh, uh, vegetables, and we will call sweet things fruits, even though they may not botanically be um, either one of those things. So, um, so this here is a slicing cucumber. Um, all cucumbers have a uh, common ancestor that actually is native to India. Um, they were probably very small and very bitter at that time. So this family, this whole family of cucurbits includes cucumbers, squash, all squashes, um, also includes melons. Um, so it's a, it's a wide, very diverse family. Um, but these guys are native to India, not this particular vegetable that I'm holding, um, but all of the cucumbers, their common ancestors started in India. So hunters and gatherers would go around and they would find these small, like little bitter berries. Um, and as they grew and we learned how to cultivate things and save seeds, um, we started to breed them for thinner skins, um, finer flavor, different colors. Um, and the ones available in the grocery store, in some of your specialty grocery stores, you might find like four different kinds, but really there are thousands of different kinds of cucumbers throughout the world. So originally they were native to India, they spread across India and then through um, traders, uh, they actually moved into Egypt. Um, in Egypt, in antiquity, um, they would make, um, they were of course smaller than this, but they would make a weak liquor out of these by cutting a hole in the top taking a stick and stirring the inside, um, exposing it to air, but also kind of liquefying the inside, they would plug the top and bury it. And then you could, they bury it for a few days and then you could take it out later. It would have fermented, creating almost like a beer, um, but not quite as strong. And then they would drink it. Um, I don't recommend you doing that at home. Um, you can ferment in different ways, but there are safer ways to do it. Um, also, I don't know how delicious that would be, uh, but it is something that they did do um, in antiquity in Egypt. Um, and then through trading, it actually moved into um, ancient Greece and Rome and then up through Western Europe. And it could be grown all over um, Southern Europe because of the warm climate. Uh, eventually, um, around the um, late 1400s, early 1500s, um, there was during the Columbian exchange when the, the sort of there was a trading because of Columbus between the old world, which is Europe, and the new world, which are the Americas. Um, late 1400s, he brought cucumbers to Haiti first, and then they spread to the New World. And so by um, late 1500s, uh, they were actually the colonial gardens. There were um, colonial gardeners that were growing these as a regular vegetable that, that families would eat. Um, and in, especially because um, they came first through Virginia and further south, and that was the perfect climate for cucumbers. Cucumbers are a summer fruit. Uh, they cannot tolerate cold. So at the same time that you would be putting in your um, tomatoes uh, around May 1st um, is about the time that you would be putting in cucumbers 
um, here, uh, our climate is changing and becoming warmer. Um, and often we'll have these long, you know, these large swings here in North Carolina in the Piedmont region, which is the central region of the state. Um, some of the manuals say April 15th, you can put warm season crops in like tomatoes and cucumbers and, um, and eggplants and peppers. Um, but really, I like to wait till about May 1st, uh, because it is rare to have a frost after that. We did have one uh, last year or the year before on like May 8th, uh, which is very, very rare. Um, but by May 1st, not only is the air temperature warm enough, but the soil temperatures are warm enough to be able to germinate cucumber seeds. So you can buy cucumber plants and plant them, or you, you can start those probably seven to 10 days ahead of time inside if you would like, or you can just direct seed them. Um, there, are, there are some seeds that take, you know, three, four weeks to come up sometimes, like carrot seeds sometimes take forever to germinate. But any of the cucurbit seeds, whether it's a squash or a cucumber or a melon, they germinate really quickly and they grow very, very quickly. Um, some cucumber, some cucurbit plants can grow um, like up to a foot a day. And um, the fruit also grows very, very quickly. And that's because of the warm temperatures. When soil temperatures are warm, uh, they actually uh, boost the biological activity in the soil, making more nutrients available to the plant um, from the soil. Uh, also, with more light and longer days comes quicker and more robust photosynthesis. And you really need that in order to create a fruit. Um, you often will not have fruits uh, coming in or growing. They, their biggest boost of growth is during the summertime. You're not going to have winter fruits. You will have winter vegetables, which are things like leaves and roots and shoots. Those are, uh, you know, fall and winter and early spring things um, because the days are shorter and there's not enough light to create a fruit. A fruit is the most expensive thing that a plant can make, um, fruit with seeds. So um, to create this sort of like juicy body to hold the seeds inside, um, that's very expensive for a plant to make and it requires a lot of light because the plant will breathe in um, carbon dioxide from the air and through photosynthesis and using water and minerals from the soil, it will create starch. So uh, there's not very many calories in here. There's not a lot of starch in uh, cucumbers, but um, there's a cellulose body that holds about 96% water. So these are um, just absolutely full of water. So when you grow a cucumber or any plant that creates a fruit, you wanna make sure that it has plenty of water. It likes loamy soil, which we do not have here in North Carolina. Um, so you can amend the, the clay soils with um, some really good compost so that it drains well and it's fluffy and you're able to grow cucumbers. They're very, very easy to grow. They actually have these little tendrils that come off of them like little curly hairs that grab onto trellises. So they're anything like, a, they're great to grow on a, um, like a chain link fence. Um, I always like putting a bed next to a fence because it's an automatic, a fence does a couple of different things. It keeps animals out, keeps your plants safe inside. And then also you can grow vining crops up um, onto a, um, a, a trellis or a fence um, and it's there all the time. So uh, these are very, very easy to grow. So this is a common slicing cucumber. Um, often you will find these and they are waxed. Um, that's so that when you get them in the store, it's a food safe wax. Um, usually it is petroleum based. In order to get it off of here, you could either peel it or you can, I use a biodegradable unscented soap to wash the wax off and rinse it very well. Don't use things like um, scented soaps or, um, uh, like Dawn dishwashing liquid, or they're very effective at removing waxes, um, but often they will leave things behind. So a biodegradable scent-free soap is, is great to use um, to get this, the, the wax off of here. That's so that they can pick them, throw them in a box, keep them cold, and, uh, and then truck them across long, long distances and they won't dry out or rot. Um, so that's why um, you'll often see them wax, they'll feel real greasy and it doesn't taste that great to eat. But you can easily just wash these with water and then peel them and, and they're good to go. Um, you do take off some of the fiber when you peel them, but also um, you make them more digestible because these are pretty thick skinned. So um, let's move on to some other kinds of cucumbers because there are many, many, many different kinds, but we're just mainly gonna talk about the ones that you generally get in the grocery store. Okay, so these kinds right here are English cucumbers. 
And here's another kind called Persian. Um, so English cucumbers are often grown in a hothouse in a controlled environment. And when you trellis these, they hang and they grow really, really straight. Um, as long as you have enough nutrients, they'll grow pretty straight. There's even varieties where they'll put a small weight on the bottom of these and they'll grow perfectly straight, especially in Asia where they very much um, uh, pride themselves on um, sort of specific horticulture. You can get like square shaped melons. And I mean, we'll talk about that next week during melons, but cucurbits in Asia, um, especially in Japan, um, they have like perfectly straight cucumbers and perfectly round melons. And, you know, they're, they're very big into um, very specific sort of um, curated cucurbits. Um, so this one's just a regular English cucumber. It has a slight curve in it, so it didn't have a weight on it, but these grow super, super fast. And often um, there's, there was a, uh, when you grow these in, in these very, very tall hoop houses or very tall uh, greenhouses, they often will have um, strings that go all the way up to the ceiling and they will grow them on a single string. And as the, the cucumbers grow, because they'll grow from the bottom first, then they pull the string down and the cucumber co continues to grow up and they get these perfectly straight, perfectly beautiful cucumbers with uh, no, um, uh, there's no blemishes on any of them. It's a very sort of curated, um, controlled environment. So anything in a greenhouse or a hoop house is considered controlled environment agriculture because you are as a human controlling what inputs, not only how much light, how much water, um, but also how much wind is exposed to, if it's exposed to pollinators or not. So that's controlled environment agriculture. And these types of cucumbers are grown in that sort of, um, that type of agriculture. These are considered burpless. That means that the skin is very thin. Um, these types of cucumbers sometimes can be indigestible to people because of the skin. There is a chemical in them um, called cucurbitacin um, that actually is indigestible for some people and um, will cause them to burp or to have gas. And so in order to prevent that, you can peel these to make them more digestible for people, or you can get these thin skinned varieties. Um, you get them thin skinned and the, there's very little juice on the inside um, and, and they're a little bit more fibrous and they've got little, little teeny tiny seeds in them. And so these are more digestible because the skin is very, very thin. Um, they're wrapped in plastic, they're not waxed, but they're wrapped in plastic so that they can be shipped over long distances. Um, they usually come from Europe, um, sometimes India. India produces about 80% of the world's cucumbers these days. So um, these are very delicious. I really enjoy these. This is usually what I buy if I'm buying cucumbers. I rarely do though, because during the summer, my backyard produces so many cucumbers that I get sick of them and don't probably eat them again until the summertime. I'm like that with tomatoes a lot too. Um, the summer is such a production time for fruits um, that only occasionally will I buy some stuff out of season, um, especially because if you get tons of it for free from your backyard, um, it's kind of, uh, it's hard to buy it. So these are Persian cucumbers and they are like almost like a mini me of the English cucumbers. So they usually come wrapped in plastic. They're super thin skinned. Um, often people will just eat these whole because they've got these tiny, tiny little seeds. The skin is super, super thin. They're not waxed. They're usually um, wrapped and then packaged. Um, Sometimes people don't like to be, buy these because they almost always come in a package. I did go to a Latin market um, when I visited Arizona this last week, and they actually had these in bulk. And that was the first time I've ever seen them in bulk. They're usually wrapped in plastic. So these are another hothouse cucumber that are usually grown in a controlled environment, but you can grow them in your backyard. Um, if you grow like even one plant, that's enough for a family of four. If you grow two or three plants, you're probably going to want to start pickling something or preserving something um, in order to um, uh, lengthen the life of them and enjoy them over time, but also to use them up. Um, if people don't have gardens, this is a great thing to give away and you will have so many of them. If you grow cucumber plants, you need to check on them just about every day because you will have a cucumber in, in the morning that looks like this. In the evening, it'll be as big as this and the next day it can be big as this. And if it's not a variety that's supposed to grow this large, like this variety isn't supposed to get bigger than this. If it does, it becomes bitter. The seeds are hard and it's no good. So these are three different varieties but just size wise, they grow super, super fast. And if you let your cucumbers get big and hard and like the skin is all thick and hard and stuff and the, the seeds on the inside are mature, the plant has done its job 
to create more seeds for the next generation and it will stop producing cucumbers for you. So make sure to go and pull your cucumbers every day. You're gonna have so many, even this variety, I pick smaller than this. I try to pick them when they're little because um, they're more tender. To me, they're more delicious and you're just gonna get more of them. So you might as well just pick them when they're a lot smaller. Okay, so let's move on to pickling cucumbers. So this is a pickling cucumber. You can see it's like real bumpy and small. This one has a slightly lower water content. It's harder, it's got a thick skin. If you grow these, you can actually eat them as um, salad cucumbers if you like. They're still delicious like that, but they're more fibrous on the inside. So they do not have, pardon me, um, they do not have um, as much water and they're great to pickle because if you're trying to keep your vinegar very acid, it needs to be below 4.6, your pH in, in pickles. Um, and if you use uh, these pickles, you don't need to salt them first to draw a lot of water out. You can just make a hot brine and throw them in and then hot water bath can them and you can make pickles. Um, so hot water bath canning, um, if you are going to can, start with that. Um, if you're going to pickle things, pickling things is really easy. Making jelly and pickles is sort of like canning 101. Um, you should master that before you go on to pressure canning, which is considered low acid foods, which that's 4.6 and higher, um, pH 4.6 and higher. Um, any recipe that you get, it should come from the National Center for Home Food Preservation. If you put that in a search engine, it will bring it up. It's a site from the USDA and they're constantly testing recipes to make sure that they're safe because you definitely don't wanna grow botulism in your home. Um, it's very difficult to grow botulism in pickled things because of the pH. Um, botulism will not grow in an acidic environment. So it's much easier and safer to do pickles. Than, then once you master this skill, you can do things like ham and bean soups and um, you know canned fishes and um, canned green beans and things that are not pickled. Um, and that requires a pressure canner, but that's a whole different class. So let's talk a little bit about pickles. So I was pretty fascinated. Um, like I love, you know, this actually, not that I'm promoting in a particular brand, but this is a dill pickle. And this is a North Carolina company. Um, I love these because they're like sliced really thin. You can put them on sandwiches. Um, but I also love whole dill pickles. I grew up eating um, spicy dill pickles. Um, you could buy them in an individual bag. I would save my money and then walk up to the Quick Mart um, in the summer and they had these cold, spicy dill pickles. And I would walk back home like eating this whole gigantic dill pickle. I loved it. It was wonderful in the summertime. Um, but uh, pickles are very easy to make. They're available in all different kinds. You can get them sweet. You can get them spicy. You can get them dill. Um, and so you can always start with, uh, with these type of cucumbers if you want to make pickles. And then my favorite little dill pickle this is called a cornichon. These are immature. They're basically this species of cucumber. And you pick them when they're little tiny babies, right when they come off the, um, right when they come off of the vine, right when, they, when right after they're pollinated, they, they grow and you can get them in jars. And you'll often see these in, um, when you go to like a, fancy, um, like uh, when you get like a fancy cheese plate or they're served with charcuterie, which is like sliced cured meats. You'll often see cornichons or gherkins. That's another name for them. Um, you'll see these because they, they're acid. So they cut fat and richness. So you'll eat something fatty and rich, like a prosciutto or a cured ham of some kind and a piece of cheese. And then you can take a bite of cornichon and it cleanses your palate for the next bite of things. Um, these are really fun. Um, they're very um, herby and delicious and there's almost no seeds inside because they haven't had time to develop. So um, they're great to use like if you're going to stir them in or, or add them to like a when you're garnishing deviled eggs or um, when you're making like a tuna salad, this is a really great little ingredient. And they're also, they look fancy. They don't cost very much, just a couple bucks for a, a jar, but it's a way to kind of like make things a little more fancy without spending a ton of money. Um, if you're gonna do uh, like a little display around the holidays of like a cheese plate or something that you're bringing to um, someone's house. So this is just a variety of different things you can get in the grocery store, but I wanted to show you one thing that's very popular in the South that I only found out since I moved here and that's cool lickles or Kool-Aid pickles. So this is a picture of them, but what you would do is get dill pickles. So this started in the Delta, the Mississippi Delta um, in that region of the US. And uh, for fundraisers, like church fundraisers, like rather than a bake sale, people would sell, you know, if they wanted to go on a field trip or something, school children would sell cool lickles. And that's where you take 
dill pickles, you dump out the juice, take about a quart of pickles, dump out the juice, and you mix in like two thirds to three quarter cup of sugar and a packet of Kool-Aid um, or whatever store brand, um, either fruit punch or cherry drink. I've never had them, but I know they're popular because I've seen them at some church cookouts around. And uh, I, I don't know if I'd make a whole jar of them because I don't think I'd eat them all, but um, I'm kind of interested to try one because I mean, what a weird culinary regional delight. Believe me, nobody else in the US knows about these, but apparently they're very popular among the South. So, um, so yeah, so go ahead and give that a try sometime and uh, email me and let me know what you think. But we are just about out of time for talking about cucumbers. So why don't I go ahead and open it up for questions and um, we can talk about either cucumbers, pickles or whatever you want. Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, when you make those Kool-Aid pickles, you have to save me one, okay? I will have to. I think the office might enjoy them, actually. I think I might try it. They only take yeah. a week, you know, and yeah. leave a note, go to the fridge and get one and give me a report. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, so our first question is, do you need to have bees to make cucumbers grow? Uh, it depends on the type of cucumber. So there are certain um, self-pollinating vines that you don't need them. And then there are certain ones that you do. So um, it just depends on the variety. Usually if it has like seeds that you can save, it's been pollinated by a bee, um, but it just depends on the variety. There's male flowers and female flowers on most of the plants. And that it's, sometimes that's temperature dependent. Um, sometimes the female, the female flowers come out when it's hotter and then you just have a couple of male flowers. You really only need like one male flower for many, many female flowers. Um, but um, it just depends on the variety. Uh, sometimes like a cross pollination actually gives you better um, yield. Um, there's one picture of one that's like a really good cross pollinator um, and that's the lemon cucumber. Um, that's this guy right here. This is a really excellent pollinator. Uh, these get really bitter when it gets hot. I don't really grow these. I used to because um, they're really easy to grow in real hot regions and um, when I lived in Arizona I would, I would grow them every year but they look pretty for about a week and then they're so bitter you can't eat them, but they do cause like a boost in um, uh, in growth of, of other cucumbers. So you can kind of leave them around or feed them to chickens or something. But um, yeah, there's we're looking at green cucumbers, but across the world, those yellow ones, there's brown ones from Russia. I tried to grow those. And one of our master gardeners who works in the greenhouse is like, absolutely not. You are not going to grow brown cucumbers. No one will eat them. And she was right. But I just love weird food. So I want to try to grow them. But um, but yeah, so not necessarily, but sometimes. OK, that's good. Um, then how about the pruning of cucumber plants? What is the proper way to prune your plant to keep it healthy and growing lots of fruit? I never have pruned plants in that way. So um, maybe people are thinking of like tomatoes around here. There's like cultural growing practices across the world. Um, usually in moisture environments, like what we have here, we have really high humidity. Um, you wanna make sure that the plant has enough space, like three to five feet in between the vining type plants um, because they're gonna spread out. And if they overlap each other, you can have cucumber beetle, which, um, that could happen, doesn't matter how far distance your plants are, but they carry bacterial wilt and they can cause um, your plants to just die off. Um, also, if they're overlapping and they're all over each other, um, they're susceptible to mildew, uh, to what is it, uh, like powdery mildew. Um, so to prevent that, plant them far enough apart. But I've never, I've never pruned um, cucumber plants. People may. Um, I just never have. I just let them go crazy and they, they're super easy to grow. Um, I think like people will, will definitely pinch off suckers of tomatoes here in the South. Um, in drier environments, you don't do that because in drier environments, the sun is unrelenting and you need as much foliage as you can get to shade the fruit so it won't scorch in the sun um, and also to hold the moisture around the plant. But out here in the South, you try to get things to move air through as fast as possible because fungal diseases, bacterial diseases are just so much moisture. Um, so it's easy to grow food, but you have more pests. It's a, it's a double-edged sword there. That's super interesting. I didn't realize that that was the thing that we didn't, that people outside the South. Didn't That's right. Eat. All right. Um, so our next question is um, how to tell, oh, this is interesting. So this person says that they don't know what kind of cucumbers they planted. They just had a package that said cucumbers. So how can they tell which kind 
of cucumbers they're growing. <laughs> well, I bet you if it just said cucumbers and there's nothing else on it, like if it didn't give you, I bet you it's this guy right here. Cause they're, you know, this is the run of the mill. And there's a lot of different varieties of this one. Like there's a Carolina, there's an Ashley that grow really well here in a resistant to powdery mildew. Um, like if you go to any of the like downtown stores like Barnes or um, uh, Stone Brothers and they have the bulk seed, um, those are great to buy because they're really great for our region and they're, but they're like bulletproof varieties. They're super disease resistant and stuff. Uh, but if it just says cucumber, I bet you it's a slicing cucumber. Um, oh, one thing real quick about the pickling cucumber, be careful because sometimes cucumbers will grow and they'll have these, the reason there's bumps are here is because there were little sharp spines on them before that just knock off when you touch them. So wear gloves when you're harvesting cucumbers because sometimes they can pinch you. Um, but if they don't have any little spines on them, I bet those bad boys are gonna come out and they'll have, th these almost never have spines on them. And um, just pick them when they're young, no matter what they are, if they're cucumbers, pick them when they're small and you're gonna love them. Baby vegetables are delicious. You keep saying that and upsetting me. Um, <laughs> I know I've said that before to people that are like a baby carrot. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so good though. <laughs> Um, so we have a follow-up question about the bees. Um, how, if we do need bees, how do we attract them to our fruit, to our, our flowers? Um, well, they're going to find you because, uh, don't spray your backyard with dangerous stuff. Um, so, you know, just be real careful about what you spray around your yard. Yes, Roundup is necessary. Sometimes we have plants that can burn your skin off around here. You know, there's, uh, you know, some pretty vicious bugs out there. Um, but just don't willy nilly spray things. You know, that's, that's the really important thing um, because you know, there are areas of the world that people have sprayed such long lasting chemicals that the bees will never come back. They're just gone and they have to hand pollinate. Um, there's a couple of provinces in China where um, people hand pollinate like whole trees of pears because they sprayed so much, so many pesticides that are persistent in the environment that bees just avoid the area completely. Um, so, uh, just be careful of what you spray. And the more you plant, the more they're going to come around. So it isn't just honeybees. It's also bumblebees and carpenter bees and butterflies and wasps. Don't just, if you have a wasp's nest, I understand why you would want to spray it. Absolutely. Because wasps um, can sometimes be um, very aggressive. Um, however, if they're just around your yard, don't willingly start spraying things because they're going to pollinate your food. Um, some of them eat meat, but some of them are pollinators or vegetarians and are pollinators. So just be careful of what you're spraying. Um, and then um, often like the solitary bees are the one like the carpenter bees and the bumblebees and stuff. They pollinate a lot of our like kind of garden crops. If you have small crops, if you want to attract um, bum, I mean, uh, honeybees, uh, they have flower fidelity. They're social creatures and they dance um, to communicate with one another where the biggest source of flowers is so that most of that hive can go and feed off of one tree or one source um, of, of flowers. So um, I plant way more than I would need so that I can share with my neighbors, but it's more attractive to pollinators if there's a mass of flowers than if there's just four or five. Um, but don't worry, pollinators will find you as long as you're, you know, plant some flowers around. Sunflowers are great. Oh my gosh. If you have one sunflower or two sunflowers in your yard, you go through this like amazing um, period where there's first uh, nectar and it's, and, and it's just mobbed with pollinators. You'll see all kinds of bees, all kinds of butterflies. Um, and then the, the, it gets pollinated and the seeds come out and then the head falls and it gets mobbed by birds which is awesome because you have all these birds that will fly underneath and grab a seed and then hang out on the top like a little chill pad and, and break apart the seed. So you'll usually get a volunteer the next year coming up in that spot because they'll drop seeds. So that's kind of fun. But it also just attracts a mass of pollinators um, because it's such a big place to feed that there'll be a lot of, and then by, you know, just by proxy, they're going to pollinate a lot of things around. If you want to keep the birds from eating your cucumbers and tomatoes though, harvest that flower for flowers in your house before it goes to the seed stage. Otherwise you're going to have birds everywhere pecking one hole out of a fruit and flying away and it'll make you crazy. <laughs> That's my advice. That's really good. Very good advice. Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, well, I 
think we are out of questions. So, and we only have one minute. So I guess we're just about out of time or I would ask you my next question, but now I'll save it for next week because okay. I know we're staying with this family. Awesome. Well, join us next week. We'll be talking about melons of all different kinds. How to pick one. How do you know if it's right? Is it a musk melon or is it not? All those sorts of things. So it's perfect for this time of year. So, um, so join us next week. Thank you, Sherilyn. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone.